Okay, um, I guess I'll share my screen uh, for the agenda and um, cool. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, so um, proposal 839 passed um, for our funding for uh, 2024. So um, yeah, you know, we'd like to thank everybody who um, who supported us uh, and also, you know, who just participate in the conversation. Um, and um, yeah. Um, we also just, to, I'm gonna post a tweet thread about this today, but we also, we, we, we put up a forum post out about it yesterday, but um, the uh, liquidation multi-sig, uh, which included five hub validators, um, uh, sold the, uh, at the USDC portion of the budget, um, and then also returned um, returned a lot of the spend to the community pool. So um, we had built in a twenty five percent buffer, and due to the price rise, we didn't you know the buffer didn't need to be touched at all, um, and also um, you know more was returned um, you know than was when was originally budgeted for. So um, out of about 1.1 million atom, um, 410,000 atom was returned to the community pool um, on, on Monday. So um, the next step with that is, uh, and this is also in the forum post too, but basically um, the liquidation multi-sig is waiting for CC CCTP to be activated. Um, right now the USDC is held in the Ethereum multi-sig by them. Uh, and CCTP will be activated on Noble later this month. Once that's activated, uh, they'll be able to send the USDC to Noble. Um, and then from there, um, they'll the liquidation multi will send to the hub and then into vesting accounts um, for Informal and Haifa, which will vest over the course of 2024. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, any any questions about that from anybody? Although I can move on to the next thing. Congratulations. Oh, so what was that? Congratulations. No questions. Thank you. Congratulations. Nice. You're welcome. Okay. So, uh, so here's a, a, this is a discussion item that's important to discuss. Um, B14 with cryptographic equivocation. Um, we need to make, uh, we need to make some decisions on this. Um, and basically, uh, we, we put this in the forum post already, but the way that cryptographic equivocation works, uh, so equivocation, um, it's kind of a mouthful, cryptographic equivocation, you know, verification. So basically slashing people for double signing uh, without slash packets and without voting. Um, the way that it works in ICS and probably also the way that it will work in many restaking protocols. Um, so uh, it will it will work this way in Mesh. Um, we're going to review their code tomorrow. And also, I think it basically be something a lot like this in most eigenlayer implementations um, in Babylon and stuff. Um, is that double signing is like um, double signing is basically when you when you sign on the same chain ID at the same height at the same round with different block hashes, um, and that can happen if you just double sign by running two nodes or whatever. It can happen, which is how it has always happened in the past because nobody's actually intentionally double signed. It's always been mistakes. Um, it can also happen if you're actually intentionally double signing to do a double spend attack. Um, which is, you know, why the slashing is there, but, uh, and then it can also happen with this and actually in the current implementation too, people don't realize this, but it can happen if you run two different chains with the same chain ID, um, because, you know, cryptographically, there's no saying that they're not, you know, two blocks in the same chain. Right. So, and I think everyone knows this, that you cannot be running different chains with the same chain ID. Otherwise you're at risk. Um, so for instance, just for an example, um, without any kind of ICS or anything, uh, if you were just to take a standalone Cosmos chain and you were to, let's say you were to, um, let's say it was Chihuahua chain, you're, you're running Chihuahua and then you say, hey, let's start a, I don't remember what the chain ID is on, I think it's like Wawa or something, Wawa one or something. And you say, hey, let's start a, um, a test net. We'll use the same chain ID, it's a great idea. And you start a test net of Wawa, and you also have the chain ID be Wawa one. Um, if the uh, if if the blocks like if the blocks uh, overlap, if the block numbers overlap, then 
you will be producing cryptographic evidence of double signing because you'll have to sign one block on the Wawa one test net and one block on mainnet. But like the slashing logic can't know that, right? So if you use the same um, private keys. Yeah, that's exactly. Say that's right. Yeah, that's of course, of course. It's not the same private keys, it doesn't matter. So basically if you're using your same private keys on uh chains that have different ch have the same chain ID but are different chains, you are double signing and you could be slashed. Um, now, to actually do that, we require somebody to put together the evidence. You'd have to know how the format of the evidence looks and stuff, but that's not really hard to figure out, of course. So um, now where V14 comes in with this is that in a normal comet chain, it won't slash you, well, at least on the hub, um, it won't slash you more than um, like, uh, you know, a, a million blocks back. So... Let's say that on, uh, let's say that somebody did a Cosmos Hub 4 test for the same chain ID and um, you signed, uh, well, it's a little bit more, well, it's a good example. Well, okay, let's let's say that Cos Cosmos Source 4 started at block 10 million and there was a test net that was at block 10 million at some point. And so there's evidence from your validator having signed block 10 million on a main net and with the same private key block 10 million on this Cosmos Hub 4 test net. And this evidence exists um, right now, given the fact that block 10 million is more than a million blocks ago, that will expire. The difference with the ICS cryptographic equivocation limitation is that evidence does not expire. Um, and the reasons for that, we would like to have it expire, uh, but it's, it's, it's more complicated when you're dealing with, um, when you're slashing like on like a different chain, like there's no reliable source for what that chain's current block number is and stuff, and it becomes complicated. Uh, you know, you know, it becomes a complicated protocol design problem. So we we left the expiration out, um, and so that does make the scenario of getting slashed because you signed on another chain with the same chain ID a little bit more likely, just because it could always happen in the future too. Um, so it's possible to get slashed like this right now, but with the ICS cryptographic equivocation, it may become more likely if because the evidence will be potentially usable forever. Um, and that's the difference. And so we we want to figure out basically like we we're pretty okay with it. We put in a warning also on the up on the um you know on the forum and stuff, but basically it's like it's it's a very it's kind of very subtle and sophisticated kind of reasoning about like why it's more risky. It's like very small risk. You have to do something that I think is pretty well known to be a pretty dumb thing to do, which is to sign on you know two chains with the same chain ID with the same private key, but uh, it does increase the risks. That's that's our that's our that's why we're being very careful about this. Um, and so one thing is that with consumer chains you can assign your key. And when you assign your key, um, after three weeks, the old key that you used on a consumer chain can no longer be slashed. So it's basically like it expires actually. So if you um, if you had participated in such a test net with the same, so right now specifically to get down to brass tax, we're talking about given that there's two consumer chains, Neutron and Stride. If you ever participated in a test net where you signed blocks with uh, you know, I forget what their chain, it's Neutron 1 or Stride 1 or whatever, whatever it is, you know. If you sign blocks with the Neutron or Stride chain IDs um, and you're still using the same key that you signed those with on Neutron and Stride, you could be slashed. So, so John, that's, the, specifically, yeah. it's it's actually about Noble from Game of Chains. There was a test net with the chain ID Noble that's 1. Right. Neutron and Stride, as to the best of my knowledge, have not had duplicate chain IDs. Well, that's true, but you we don't know what happened. You know, we don't know yeah. what could have happened at some point, right? So the thing with Noble is that what we will do with Noble is we're going to make very sure that Noble does not launch their consumer chain with the same chain ID of Noble 1. They're going to have to launch it with Noble 2 or something or come up with something else. So um, that is, um, yeah, that's that's that that will eliminate that risk for Noble um, because then it won't be the same chain ID anymore. So that take care, takes care of that. But we also know, Maybe someone did a test net called Stride One. Who knows what, sure. you know, anybody could have done anything. And so it's like, basically, it's kind of like your own fault. You get slashed, but also it's just sort of like something we're also, you know, want to be sure that, you know, we, we warn everyone around. So 
basically if you reassign your key, your consumer key, um, your old key will expire after three weeks. And so then you can't be slashed anymore. So if somebody ever did sign on a test net called stride one or neutron one or whatever, if they assign a new key for, um, for the, um, you know, for, 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 for stride and neutron main nets, then they won't be slashable anymore. Um, after, th after three weeks. So by the time the upgrade goes live, so that's the messaging we're trying to get out there. Um, is just that like the risk is really small. You had to do something really stupid to get into the risk, but like you can also eliminate all of the risk by reassigning your key. So that's kind of, but it's, yeah, that's kind of the messaging we're pushing. The problem is one thing we've realized in the past week though, and, and what we need to sort of think about here is that, um, if you, so if you were using your hub key, if you're using the same key you used to sign on the hub, your provider key to sign on a neutron or stride testnet with the same chain ID, then reassigning will not help you um, because your provider key doesn't expire. So basically, um, So basically, like if, if there was a validator who using their hub key, which they also now use on Neutron, also signed on a Neutron testnet a year ago or something with that same key, which is their, which is their hub key, um, they, they could be slashable and reassigning their consumer key won't help them. Um, so that is, that is the risk that we recently discovered but it is a very, very small risk. I don't even know if we should be worried about it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anybody has any any opinions about that. Um, as far as we know, there have been no test nets from those chains um, in the past with the same chain ID. So it seems like it's non-existent, but just, yeah, I don't know if there's any opinions on this, if people understand what I'm even talking about, but yeah. I do understand. It cool. sounds like quite an edge case. And um, it's good that we're warning people, though, because, like, imagine that you were a nasty guy, right? Imagine the Cosmos Hub 4 testnet that begins on the current block height. <laughs> Potentially with some Byzantine instructions. You wouldn't catch all the validators, of course, but could you catch 10? I kind of think so, actually. Yeah, you get the, yeah. I mean, there's, there's definitely people out there who, who uh, yeah. I don't know, but it is a pretty clear case of double signing, too. It's kind of like you're supposed to know what you're doing as a validator. But yeah, it's not some, you know, yeah, it's I, not I a mean, risk I, I take lightly. I, I think it makes sense to spend time as you just did, sort of just like, hey, everybody, hey, world. There it's just this edge case. Bad stuff could happen. And, you know, should validators join a network named Cosmos Hub 4 uh, and then use their legitimate privval.json files? Well, um, uh, you know, salute emoji, right? Yeah. Well, in any case, so for Noble, People can, if everybody reassigns their consumer keys, if that's the best practices, then it, the risk is non-existent. Also, if we make them not use the same chain ID. The one thing is for Stride and Neutron, although we're very sure that they never ran test sets with the same chain ID, they've been good about that. Um, that risk does exist because people already signed. If people are using their hub key on those networks still, they already signed blocks. Um, so, so yeah. So to eliminate this risk of not being able to reassign your provider key, it's like we would actually have to, um, we would have to like uh, build a whole new feature into the cryptographic application. It would, would delay the release out till next year. Um, so it, it doesn't seem worth it for this edge case to us. Um, but yeah, that's just what we're, we're thinking about. So unless we decide to pull the brakes last minute because of this tiny edge case, um, you know, the uh, release is jogging along, so yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we can move on to SDK 47. Um, maybe I'll let Marius or, or Matia or someone uh, handle this, this item. 
Sure, I can take over unless my theory wants to jump in. Um, so just to add the 314 release was uh, is out. So as long as we don't uh, decide last moment, as Jahan said, to change our mind, uh, we plan to submit a proposal on the hub tomorrow or worst case scenario on Friday, but I guess tomorrow. The testnet is already updated. Cool. Uh, SDK 47 on uh, Gaia. So um, the audit is done. The, uh, the SDK already released another uh, version of SDK 47. So uh, a patch version where they are fixing some, uh, some tiny things from the audit. Uh, there was nothing major found from, uh, this is at least my, like I guess the final report would be published soon. Um, we start working on uh, porting LSM to 047. So we talked to Zaki and we decided to reshift priorities in within our own team and to allocate some engineering resources from our own team. To There are a lot of things happening at the moment in uh, Cosmos and uh, regard, around Cosmos Hub with the inflation and all this stuff. And this is, from the point of view of our team, is priority number one because uh, the hub is running outdated software for a while already, right? So IBC is getting discontinued, IBC4. Of course, they will maintain for emergency issues, but we cannot continue doing that. Uh, and we also, the SDK45, it's, yeah, it's uh, discontinued for a while. Of course, we are running on a separate branch that is maintained by the SDK team, but still we want to move to 47. Um, so the target is the next release. The thing is, we really want to avoid releases around the winter holidays to not, it's not a good idea in general to have there because people are in vacation, people are doing things and we just end up with validators not upgrading on all of this. Uh, it's, it's a hassle. Right? And if there are problems, there will be nobody to actually, and you don't want people to jump during the holidays to jump on something. So. Most likely the target for V15 will be January. The, so the beginning of next year, we'll try to have everything ready by the end of the year. So most likely even earlier. Uh, cool. Oh, one other thing. I don't know if it's in here somewhere else. Need. Oh, the, the, the main commission is going to be V15 yes. as well. Yes. So that's something that I put as a discussion, but it's good to kind of mention it. Uh, it didn't make sense to delay V14 to actually start implementing the main commission, uh, the main commission, the, and 47 has it as a parameter, right? So that will be much easier to just not bother with it. We just upgrade 47. We have the parameter there. We set it to 5%. We also need though to write migration software, uh, migrations of migration code to to enforce it across all the validators, not just because the parameter affects just validators that are joining. So uh, these two messages, create new validator and edit validator. Uh, so yeah, we, we want to enforce the 5%. If not, it will be very unfair to, to the entire community. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about that. So it will go together with uh, in V14, in V15. Cool. Uh, what's next? Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, interchange security with uh, downtime jail throttling, uh, the like the rewrite. So we have a version two. It was it's implemented for a while. We we kind of left it there. We were focusing on guy and other stuff, uh, and it was a pressing issue. We cut a release. A release candidate is currently being tested by Haifa. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and cut the final release once we have confidence that, so once the testing is passing, basically. Um, so that will contain, so V3 to zero will contain changes for both the provider and the consumer. Keep in mind that at the moment, the only provider that Interchange Security has is the hub. So our focus is the hub. And also due to LSM, the hub currently is on a fork of SDK, a fork that is maintained by the SDK team also, but it's on a fork, which means that the hub requires a fork of interchange security. So we need to maintain always this dash LSM 
So if you look now of what's or what's the code that runs on v14, for example, it will be something like v230 dash provider dash lsm. So that prefix dash lsm will always be a fork of interchain security. There are not large changes, just as some some minor things that enable uh, the support for uh, LSM that are needed there. Um, we are also working on porting the cryptographic equivocation for V14. Again, that's for 0.45 to port them to SDK 0.47. We expect this to be done by the end of the week or next week. Uh, this is basically needed for Gaia V15. And as a result, we'll just uh, put it in uh, ICS v330, right? So we'll release another version of our interchain security with it. Um, and we are almost done with upgrading ICS to the latest version of SDK and, of course, IBC and uh, IBC 8. So again, uh, that's targeting ICS v4. So we'll jump the major version uh, since it's a library API breaking change. Uh, yeah, I think we are also very close there. Uh, we are working closely with uh, with uh, Olympics on this. So yeah, cool. Then um, the next uh, thing is, um, oh yeah, we were saying before that we were working towards removing VSC mature packets, right? So to make we are we are working to simplify the protocol, ICS protocol, and make it um, read only. So we found a potential obstacle in doing that. Uh, the idea of removing, so the main idea was let's simplify the protocol, right? Let's make it simpler. It will be easier to maintain. It will be easier to expand to stuff like opt-in or mesh, all of these things. However, after looking into it, it seems like it's not simplifying. It's simplifying the normal operation case. But if you start looking into things like downtime or relaying problems, then the protocol becomes very uh, so much uh, more complicated. So I'm not going into details. Uh, it's ar around the downtime of consumer chains, which may leave the uh, leave the chain in an insecure state from where it's not really probably it's impossible to recover safely. Right. So we do want we will write a report about our uh, findings. And what we'd want to do, put a pin into it. So publish the report clearly, have a conversation with the community. Maybe somebody has a cool idea so that we'll welcome that. And then refocus our attention on opt-in and partial set security, right? So try to see what are the needs there and can we do it without removing VSC mature packets? Um, yep. And the last part, uh, we are making progress uh, model-based uh, based testing. So we are making progress with uh, integrating model-based testing on interchain security. So we already have a Quint model of interchain security. It's the first version of the model. It doesn't in, it doesn't contain all the all the sub protocols and the latest version of interchain security, but still contains the the main uh, the main protocols like. Uh, VSC packets being sent and VSC mature packets sending back uh, some parts of slashing, all of these things, right? And uh, basically what we have a prototype working. What we want to do actually is from the model, we are generating traces. This is basically a sequence of events and we want to fit the sequence of events to a driver, a test driver, right? So that we basically generate a test automatically using a certain sequence of events that is representative to check different invariants. So this is very promising. Of course, it's experimental. That's the reason we approach it in a very lean approach, right? So we iterate, we create prototypes, we see that they are working and then we expand, right? So we want to invest a limited amount of time into it, see if it works. If we validate this uh, approach, then we will put more resources into it because it's very promising. I'm, I think everybody in the team is very excited about this uh, this direction. Uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. I think. Any questions? I'll just say another thing about the VSC mature packets. Um, they pause on bondings basically, or the unpause on bondings, right? So um, when neutron um, 
had a delay uh, starting. It actually ended up pausing on bottings uh, three weeks later um, for a few days, and we had to put out messaging around that. So that's another big reason to remove them. Um, and um, however, on on um, you should probably get neutron update their settings, but on Stride they use a two week unbonding period on the consumer, which means that the chain can be down for up to a week before unbonding start to get paused. So um, that that should uh, you know. Uh, reduce the likelihood of having an unbonding pausing event on, on the hub. Um, so, uh, yeah. Another discussion that it's worth having at some point is whether we really need the difference between the trusting period and the unbonding period to be one week. Do we need actually that week to submit evidence of misbehavior or light client attacks? Because at the moment you have on the hub, you have three weeks unbonding period. And the uh, trusting period for all light clients that are pointing towards the hub is two weeks. So is this uh, this kind of this rule of thumb to choose the trusting period two thirds of the unbonding period? And um, this is a safe option, but it's again one of these parameters that is just thrown there, and it's left like this because it didn't affect anything. So uh, yeah, is do we need seven days? Is are two days enough? These are questions that we probably should find an answer to. Yeah, the, the trusting period is the time after which IBC clients freeze uh, if they're not updated. Um, and so it, it's supposed to be shorter than the unbonding period, but we don't know exactly how much shorter it really needs to be. So uh, asking consumer chains to shorten their unbonding periods, of course, it's very relevant because then it also makes their trusting period shorter, which can become an operational um, issue for them where their IBC clients might freeze. So, yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah, what uh, the, the rationale be behind removing the, the VCS uh, mature packets? Because it was there from the beginning and now you want to remove it. Sorry, I probably missed some, some of the rhetoric, but uh, so you can explain. The, the rationale for it is that so it's these two things that one that Jehan pointed, right? So what we do at the moment, we pause unbonding. So we artificially extend unbonding on the provider yes. mm -hmm. to wait for the consumer to unbond as well. Yep. Right. So this make this ensures that whatever validators are doing on the consumers, they are doing it while the collateral, their collateral is locked on the provider. Right, mm -hmm. so to ensure that actually the proof of proof of stake on the consumer actually works, or yeah. the 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 block production on the consumer is done under proof of stake conditions, right? If you kick it out, then this is a big question mark, right? Because you do need to have locked collateral for a certain period of time to be able to validate blocks mm -hmm. to avoid the nothing at stake attack. So this is one thing that we wanted to get rid of this dependency between consumers and the unbonding periods on the provider since it affects users, user experience, right? So nobody really wants to unbond their tokens and to wait for four weeks instead of three weeks. Uh, the other thing is we just would, if, if it works, we'll just remove another, we remove a message. So interchain security has like three messages, IBC messages, right? So IBC packets, right? is the VSC, uh, VSC packets, which basically you send validator updates, is this confirmation that comes back to say that I had the unbonding on the consumer expired, right, passed, and is the slash packets. So we were thinking, okay, you remove one, it's you clearly simplify the protocol. Uh, this mature packets also have, uh, uh, require some implementation in, uh, in the staking module, so we are connected into the SDK. That's the reason at the moment we, on 45, we are actually having a fork uh, of, we had the fork of SDK even before LSM was added, right? So we are running on something 045.16-ICS-LSM, right? So in 47, these changes were integrated, but still it would be nice to not have to depend on changes in the SDK module, right? And a customized SDK module. So th these are the benefits. 
Okay, but you want to replace it with something or you just want to move it and see what's happening? So this is an idea that we got from AIB. So Jay, Jay suggested this and it's it's an interesting idea. It's not to replace it, to just assume a level of synchrony between the two chains. And the idea was to, so one idea would be to just have the unbonding period three weeks and treat the consumer chain as it either receives the VSC packet, so the update within a certain period of time, otherwise it will just drop them and it will get in an insecure state or something okay. like that. Okay, great. So, so that's good because, yeah, we yeah. already have a draft idea on that. So I think. That's yeah, amazing. but that's the thing. I don't know exactly how to... The, the problem is we do not know how to move from that insecure state back to a... So to safely move back to a normal operation state. Sure. Should be tricky, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, it also depends on how what your what your assumptions are and what you what you want from the security. Um, I think that in well, in my personal opinion, I think Marius differs on this, but in real life, you would never, I don't know, run into a problem. But uh, but yeah. Anyway, it's about being able to, you know, to I guess put strict definitions of what security you're providing is. So, um, yeah, looking forward to the report. Um, okay, well, let's move on to Haifa. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, Lex or Denise or someone can present. Yeah, Dante, you want to go? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the last couple of weeks we've been uh, testing the V fourteen. Uh, both RC0 and RC1. Last week we upgraded the uh, both testnets to V14 RC0, and then uh, I think RC1 was cut uh, yeah on Monday, and we upgraded both testnets today. Everything works out properly uh, from what we can see. Main feature being the crypto cryptographic convocation. All our tests seem to indicate that it's working fine. Um, so that's V14. Uh, we'll probably uh. Submit a proposal to for mainnet together on uh, tomorrow or Friday, and then uh, we've also been uh, investigating this block proposer issue uh, that we have in the in the replicated security testnet and the provider chain. Uh, I think a couple of weeks back, a few weeks back, there were uh, a couple of validators uh, brought up that validators were either not proposing blocks or uh, not proposing according to their voting power. Um, uh, last week, I think we managed to replicate this issue with one of our, uh, like a throwaway validator. We tried syncing a node uh, using state sync to one of our state sync nodes, create a validator, and uh, that was proposing blocks just fine. Um, the list of validators that were not proposing blocks included Polkachu. So we tried using one of their testnet snapshots to sync a separate node, synced it up using the snapshot, and then moved the uh, validator keys, the validator keys for the throwaway validator, into that snapshot synced node, and it stopped proposing blocks. Um, validators keep uh, signing blocks, but they're not proposing. Um, and then if we go back to the node that was doing the state sync it went back to proposing blocks. Um, we haven't replicated this behavior since we upgraded to v14, but uh, we'll probably do that either today or tomorrow. Uh, if that's the case, if it's still the same behavior, we're using a node that's been state synced, does propose blocks, but not the one that's been uh, synced with a snapshot. Uh, it, it's going to warrant some additional conversation with uh, Polkachu. Um, the only data point we have right now is that they had mentioned that they do use uh, Cosm pruned to prune their state before uh, publishing their snapshot. It might be something to do with that, but at this point we don't know yet. Um, so we will continue with that uh, once we have state sync back up after the v14 upgrade, and yeah, we'll, you'll hear about it. Uh, we also try to uh, replicate these uh, mempool uh, issues we saw in uh, mainnet using a, a, a local testnet. We were able to replicate the issue on uh, on a testnet where uh, we submitted a large amount of transactions, 
to uh, local testnet, filling up the mempool, then as soon as the mempool went back down, filled it up again, and by the fifth wave, we started seeing a lot of missed blocks and uh, increasing block times. Um, we're uh, trying to come up with a way to say like, yes, this is how you replicate it. Um, and that's where we are right now. We were able to do this just yesterday with separate testnet that's not one of the public ones. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> how many nodes were on that testnet? Because um, I, I just want to say that like when we when we try to replicate the P2P storm's behavior on any network that doesn't resemble mainnet, I kind of think we end up getting inaccurate data is, is my opinion. So like the first question I'd have for you is just how many validators were there? Second question, how many nodes on the network in total? Third question, what's the vote power distribution? Uh, 10 validators, 30 nodes total, uh, exactly the same voting power for all validators. Okay. Um, I mean, it's not terrible, not by any means. Um, so, okay, 10 validators. And, and one other question about the infrastructure. Um, where were those 10 validators relative to each other? Uh, spread out between North America and Europe. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's not exactly what mainnets look like, but it's not, not awful. Right. Um, so you had validators spread between North America and Europe and, and those validators, did they happen to share a common network or anything? What I mean by that is like, uh, if you spawned the network on, let's say, OVH Cloud, and then all your traffic is going over the OVH backplane, uh, that also favors liveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the result was that we were getting like, the same kind of deg degradation that we saw in mainnet uh, and in the replicated security testnet. Um, yeah, and, and you did that also by by um, reducing the um, reducing the, the system requirements down a lot, right? Yes, that that just yeah. helped us get to the network degradation a lot quicker than we saw yeah. in test. Mm -hmm. um, what what was the spec for like each VM or node? Uh, two CPUs, four gigs of RAM. Okay. Um, I have a comment. It's, I think, new. Um, I got DMs from the Many Things team. So they're a Korea-based team visiting Vietnam currently. And I would like to just read this to you guys so you're aware of it. I was not aware of this until today. Um, so this is about IAVL performance. Um, here we go. IAVL V0, 21, 1. After three hours running, the tree size is 410,000 with a throughput of 1,800 leaves per second. Now, the, the other versions don't, have a number of leaves, so I'll leave off the number of leaves. Uh, but the DB size on 0 0.21 was 59 gigs, and IAVL itself was using 800 megabytes of RAM. IAVL V1, after six hours of running, uh, the tree size was 1.88 million leaves. And it was capable of processing uh, 12,225 leaves per second with a database size of uh, 211 gigabytes and RAM usage of one gigabyte. Now, get ready. Next part's crazy. IAVLV2. It, the network ran for two hours 
and it had a throughput of 42,686 leaves per second. Uh, number of leaves total is unknown with a DB size of 395 megabytes and RAM usage of four gigabytes. Um, so I guess one thing that we may be able to count, and I, I've been feeling this way, right? I had no data until these guys contacted me today. Um, but it, it seems like my feeling is correct that basically updating to latest higher performance SDK, IAVL, all that, you know, that whole like dependency chain behind the store um, really, really makes a difference because I mean, we look at this. So uh, V0211, which is probably what uh, hub version 15 will use, processes 1,800 leaves per second. Uh, V1, process 12,225 leaves per second. And V2 um, will process 22,686 leaves per second. But V2 is going to use a lot more RAM. But, uh, you know, I, basically that seems like the right mix to me. I want to just let you guys know that, make you aware of it. One, so you think that it could be that the, some of the performance degradation is actually from IAVL? Um. Yes. Um, and this is related to that whole, I mean, look, IAVL is not precisely the same bottleneck as the lock contention issue. But one thing that I knew all along was that, like, there's a relationship. Uh, keep in mind, I don't believe that this is a causal relationship. I believe that, that like the P2P Storm's documentation uh, we produced, it accurately catches that basically like, hey, we can saturate a one gigabyte line, a one gigabit line. And, and if we saturate a one gigabit line, we can halt most networks. Now, keep in mind different definitions of halt. Right? Some people say that a halt is only if you need manual intervention. And I'm really talking about like 15 minutes without a block, right? That's what I'm calling a block. Um, but um, I have a feeling that basically if we continue to pound at these networks, we attack them and we gather data that includes different versions of Let's call it the store stack, because Jihan, just you know, I, you know, I don't only mean IAVL. I mean, we look at SDK fifty. We also have the collections. Um, that's yet another way of speeding things up, and the whole way that the store is used by the release of SDK fifty. You know, like it's better, it's faster, and it's much more efficient. Um. Finally, you get back to comment, right? And one piece of feedback that was discussed on the forum was also discussed with me in a, in a bunch of DMs and stuff is like, well, maybe it's the locks on ABCI. And I just want to pause it so that everybody's aware. I, my feeling is it's all of these. Check, from check TX? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That whole like check TX, deliver TX theory. Yep. So let's uh, let's go back to Dante's testing. Um, this is based on theory that um, reducing the mempool size is going to reduce the pressure on um, whatever the problem is, right? By having a smaller mempool, um, and and also that a large mempool is not necessary. Like a one gigabyte mempool is just no reason for that. Like um, uh, th that's a you know at a at a two hundred kilobyte block size that mempool is going to uh, hold five thousand blocks with transactions. There's no point in that, right? So, um, we're trying to look at whether you know what kind of performance benefits you get from decreasing the mempool size. Um, and so Dante, I just want to revisit what you were saying. So you said that basically you were 
um, you were first testing with the 200 kilobyte blocks and the one gigabyte mempool. And then you actually, to replicate with these weak nodes, you actually, you said you submitted waves of transactions um, uh, yeah. and kind of let it empty out and then fill it back up again. That's right. <clears throat> um, yeah, I can share my screen, show you the, the dashboard here. Okay. Well, what I'm, yeah, that, that might be good. We have to also have to leave in, in 10 minutes, but um, ah, what's interesting about that to me is that the waves of transactions thing is, is pretty interesting because it like, um, it's sort of, um, it sounds like a, makes it sound like a memory leak. You know what I mean? Because in the absence of a, or, or some kind of leak, right? Because in the absence of a leak, it would seem that you'd get the performance degradation when the size was big and then when the size went down it would get better again um as the transactions emptied out but if you're saying that you had to like work up to it by doing these waves by filling and emptying and it got worse and worse each time doesn't that sound a lot like a leak it kind of does yeah and and then when you reduce the mempool down to a 20 megabyte mempool um mm -hmm. you also had a similar uh wave uh the wave effect still persisted right yes but but i can only increase it by a tiny amount each time because instead of filling up a mempool with 5000 transactions i can only fill it up with 120 at a time hmm. that's yeah so so it definitely reduces the load but you can get up to um you you can get up to um uh by, by doing the waves you can get up to a point where it gets degraded again Yes. Yes. Mm. It's just going to take lo a longer time. I think, I think if I, if I leave it running the way it is right now, probably to sometime tomorrow, I'll start getting, I think I'm going to start getting missed blocks by the validators again. Yeah. And, and so that, that's this waves that does sound a lot. It sounds a lot like a leak uh, of some kind of resource. So maybe that's something that the common team could look into further, whether there's any leaks. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was wondering about with those results is, um, what does it take to then remove the degradation? Is that like resetting the node? Yes. Hmm. You know, one way that a lot of um, a lot of devices, uh, you know, that are they like, can see like embedded devices, like on the Apollo, uh, you know, computers or whatever, they have memory leaks, and they couldn't figure out where the memory leak was, so they just make the computer uh, restart. <laughs> <laughs> every, <laughs> if NASA does it. every minute or whatever and the memory gets cleared out maybe that's uh yeah yeah if it works but anyway i i, I I'm, I'm thinking so what i'm thinking is like that that's really interesting so we probably need to do more research or get the comet to do research on on whether there could be leaks anywhere no. um given that we see a leak like pattern but the other thing is that, like, um, I, I do feel like it's probably pretty, and Jacob, I wonder if you have any opinions on this, but it's pretty much, uh, there's no downside to reducing the mempool down to, you know, a few tens of megabytes. Um, you know, so it's like... Um, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. This and, is and a we should, recommendation. Yeah, and I think we should probably, once we're, I don't know what more we want to really see, but we should probably start doing an effort to roll out um, recommended configuration um recommended configuration uh, modifications to validators to say hey just reduce your max tx's bytes down um and Can I be uh, a tech for just a moment mm -hmm. so in sdk 47 uh we could if we're being heretics we can ship binaries with different defaults for stuff like that and honestly like the hub does not need more than a, let's say, 30 megabyte mempool. 30 megs, if, if every block is totally full and the two megabyte proposal passes, you know, that means 15 blocks, right? And I don't know about everybody else on this call, but it's my opinion that 15 blocks is definitely enough. Yeah, I mean, if a if a proposal if a if a if a transaction if I'm trying to send someone money and it's not getting in after uh I don't know a few blocks right like a, a minute or something I mean I'm gonna be trying trying again um so 
um, I think, uh, yeah, it definitely doesn't make sense to to store uh, transactions for for days in a huge mempool. Just seems like there's no upside. Yeah. Um, on 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 the question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Certainly, I, I agree. Like, sorry. It's me. No, no, I, I got some uh, oh, having oh, the, the reception oh. issues with Jacob. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I guess uh, one thing I want to address what Jacob said there was. Uh, there's this, there's a, there's another thing that was going on, um, which is the, in, in test nets and main net and everywhere, which is the, uh, the net split like behavior, um, where you, if you have a subset of validators who have different transaction validity criteria, um, mm -hmm. and most practically where we've seen it is they have a different minimum gas price setting. Um, those validators will handle transactions that other validators won't. And those val those transactions will get into blocks very infrequently. And so that subset of validators with different criteria is going to um, be gossiping those transactions around a lot. Um, and so they're, they're going to struggle more because the transactions will hang around more for them. It also causes other uh, reliability problems with the networking that I don't understand as well, where, where it sort of just screws things up. So um, where that comes in is uh, the suggestion there of, of actually hard coding settings into the binary instead of letting validators change them themselves. Um, that is something that we could use to uh, to uh, stop that problem. Um, so if we if we do find that that's a, that's a big problem, then you could um, if you want to roll out, let's say you want to roll out different gas prices. Um, and you didn't want anybody to have higher gas prices or whatever uh, to avoid this kind of problem. Uh, you could hard code into the binary that this is the gas price. And that way the network stays coordinated um, because these net split like issues are kind of a lot like um, consensus issues. So it's it's basically like, um, you know, similar to when you do an upgrade, you don't want nodes with different logic because then, you know, it's going to you know, be a consensus problem. So it's kind of a similar kind of thing, maybe milder, but still, still a problem. So the thing is, though, with the mempool size, um, to me, it doesn't seem like that is, I don't know, but it, to me, it seems like in theoretically that shouldn't cause those kind of net split, like the struggling subgraph issues, um, because it doesn't affect transaction validity. It's just how much each node wants to store. Um, so I don't know. That's another thing. I think we've talked about Dante, Dante may, may test soon. It's basically whether you can create those kind of problems, uh, yeah. just with a mempool size stuff, because if not, then we can just go and tell people. Change your mempool if you want your node to run better, uh, and we don't have to worry about people having different settings. Um, and um, the other thing is, you may you may actually want to have some nodes having bigger mempools. Um, it may be useful for um, RPC nodes that are used by wallets to have a big mempool mm -hmm. um, if they do want to provide some kind of functionality to their users of like. Um, because if you have a small mempool, what's going to happen when the mempool gets gets filled? Uh, transactions are going to are going to fail if you're submitting them to an RPC. So a wallet a wallet provider may actually want to say, "Hey, we want our mempool to hold transactions for a little bit longer and keep trying to get them in." Um, and so I think there there is probably a use case for having different size mempools and different nodes. We just have to check if that can create these kind of net split problems mm -hmm. um, that we've observed with the differing gas price settings. So, yeah. um, one thing. If we're talking about different size mempools on the same network, I'm a little mad. Reason I'm a little mad? Well, first of all, we can't. We won't be able to prevent that. So, like, <laughs> you know, whatever at the end of the day. But the reason I'm a little mad is I don't know if anybody's tried setting a 50 gigabyte mempool and then filling it and then letting transactions in from the mempool to the rest of the network. Let me tell you guys, it works real good. So um, even though we can't control the size of the mempool on every node, even if we hard code it, right? Just, just people can still recompile the binary and they have something different. Um, my, my preference, I guess, to like fix a certain size. 
Yeah, it's. It, 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 I think it, it, it's not necessarily bad. I, I think there's a lot of settings that are tweakable in Comet that really shouldn't be like there should just be like the right setting and that's it. There's no no questions about it, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I I guess it depends on whether there is a legitimate utility to have different size mempools. I, I could imagine for a wallet RPC there there might be, but also maybe not. Um, I think if if you're if you're submitting transactions like. You don't necessarily want to. Would, I prefer to get an immediate uh, rejection instead of um, having to wait, um, you know, hours to see to, to get through whatever mempool is in. So it may not even really be necessary to do that. But we we just want to would want to make sure that there's no use case for it before we remove it. Cool. Um, well, we're at time now. Um, thanks, everybody. I think we also pretty much covered everything. Um, we're going to keep uh, continuing to test some of these uh, settings around the mempool and performance and everything, and um, uh, we'll report on it. And we will also um, probably uh, we'll talk to the Comet team about this leak-like uh, pattern behavior we're seeing um, because maybe that's that's what's going on. Um, so, uh, yep. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm going to end the meeting. So, thank you. Bye, bye.